animal kingdom or in uh, just if you just look around in the ecosystem okay whether it can be a pond a small pond it has got um, it, it could have few creatures or a large pond or a lake could have more creatures comparatively and they are of different types there can be few fishes which are vertebrates there can be some invertebrates there can be some microorganisms some uh, semi terrestrial snails can also be present near the pond or the lake there could be some birds which are coming in and having uh maybe using that pond or lake as a habitat so there are many creatures or many animals that are depending or living together in a particular area that can be considered as a small ecosystem so a pond can be an ecosystem or even a large ocean is considered as ecosystem so when we talk about ecosystem there are animals and these animals are interrelated they have connections with each other knowingly or unknowingly they are helping each other to survive and flourish at the same time they also have connection with the non living uh, parameters or the substances that are allowed around for example air water or you can say temperature sun humidity or even the uh, we can say the salts amount of salts in the water so all these things biotic and abiotic factors in the ecosystem are related they are interdependent and we are going to study in this particular unit what are the characteristic features of these particular animals if i know if you know that this animal could be of that particular group for example a phylum or you can say a family or order or class then it becomes easier for you to get more information about that animal okay and hence the classification plays a very important role so if animals are well classified they are well uh, they are nicely put together in the different groups based on some characteristic features then it becomes easier to study okay and it becomes easier to study why it is necessary to study because of course we have to live together in harmony with those animals so we when we are looking at the Uh, survival and the uh, 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 what we can say development and progress of humans we also have to see that we are not harming those species so to protect the species we must know the species okay so in this particular lecture today's lecture we will study what are the levels of organization what are the levels okay based on what they are uh, maybe roughly divided into uh, groups or what are the basic characteristics that are used to describe an animal at first hand okay so very first if i want to uh, describe an animal what are the characteristic features that i must mention to know uh, to which group or to which phylum or to which uh, uh, class order or family it belongs to okay so first we will see what are the learning outcomes of this particular topic that you will be able to discuss different levels of organization in different animals and of course you will be you will be able to classify them into different types so i'm not saying that that you will be able to classify uh, immediately to to uh, to phylums or classes but at least to uh, roughly you can divide animals okay into different groups by studying these particular features so let us see at the end of the uh, at the end of the study of this uh, particular topic if you could do that so first the feature that we are going to study today is symmetry the symmetry is a common term that we have maybe heard many times before no so what what is the symmetry is is how the parts of the animal are arranged around a point or a plane or an axis okay so if you can say uh, um, an animal is asymmetrical that means it cannot be divided into two or more parts through a specific plane so that it will yield or it will give us same or similar parts okay so for example here there is an amoeba this is a picture of amoeba now we all know amoeba is an animal which is a unicellular it doesn't have any shape so it can change its shape it has pseudopodia and with the help of which it moves so if this animal i try to divide into let us say two equal halves 
is it possible through the longitudinal plane if i consider this as a longitudinal plane no these two halves will not be same let us change the plane try to divide it this from uh, maybe the plane uh, perpendicular to the earlier one will i will that give me two equal halves no any plane or any axis i try the amoeba is not going to give me two or more equal halves if i try to dissect the animal under microscope and as many try i give the equal halves or equal parts will not be achieved why because this amoeba is asymmetrical it doesn't have a specific symmetry the body does not have a particular axis through which the animal can be divided into different parts or the or it doesn't have axis around which the parts of the animal are arranged okay so the lower the most lower invertebrates like pr most protozoa uh, especially those who have pseudopodia those who show movement with uh, with the help of pseudopodia or those which show amoeboid movement they are asymmetrical they do not show any symmetry to the body so symmetry is something which is morphological feature looking at the animal you can be able to find out which type of symmetry this animal shows for example let us understand symmetry with the help of the other example that is bilateral symmetry now this is in butterfly if you try to dissect the butterfly through vertical plane okay this is aboral oral plane or aboral oral axis uh, oral is the mouth side and aboral is the other side that of the mouth which may not be always an inner side because in some cases the digestive system is not complete so oral side and the side opposite to oral is aboral side so through oral aboral axis if i dissect this particular butterfly i get two different parts which are exactly like each other which are mirror images of each other see the two there are two antennae so each part will get one two eyes so each part will get one and of course the wings are also similar to each other so i am getting two exactly equal parts and if you see in this particular uh, butterfly the body parts are arranged in on the two sides of the one axis now if i consider this vertical oral aboral axis i am getting two equal parts but let us consider transverse section so if i have a transverse section through this butterfly will i get two equal parts will this part would be same as this one will the uh, upper one will be same as lower one no, no so no. there are no two axes through which body is getting equal parts but there is only one axis okay there is only one plane through which when i dissect the animal i get similar parts which are most of the times the mirror images of each other and hence we can say it is bilateral symmetry when the when i am having a uh, uh, axis at oral aboral end on the lateral sides okay the lateral sides sides that i uh, get which are exactly like each other and hence it is bilateral symmetry so there could be so bilateral symmetry is quite common in animal kingdom and it is more uh, prominent in case of higher organisms so asymmetry you can see in amoeboid organisms or you can see in sponges where sponges you can when you look at the sponge you may think that it is symmetrical maybe because it is cylindrical sometimes but it grows in any direction no so actually it is asymmetrical so anybody can give me more examples of bilateral symmetry isn't it easy yes human beings human beings ma'am human beings yes human very beings good human beings what is other than human beings frog frog very good what is cockroach fish. cockroach fish right monkey monkeys yes rat earthworm earthworm rat okay okay so now so i hope you have understood now what is bilateral symmetry and bilateral symmetry is common in animal kingdom okay now there is the third type of uh, Uh, there is a third type of symmetry okay that is radial symmetry okay now in radial symmetry what happens the through one plane okay if i dissect the animal i can get many parts which are like each other 
so it is not just two parts but it but the parts are more than two which are exactly like each other so the the body parts are around uh, sorry the body parts are arranged around one axis so if the axis goes through this particular center so again it is the axis that will pass through oral aboral uh, uh, axis so then the body can be divided into uh, many parts or here in case of starfish there are five parts so it can be considered as uh, considered as pentaradial symmetry so it depends it can be octaradial it can be hexaradial so sometimes if now if the same animal if i try to uh, dissect through the uh, transverse section i will not get two or more equal parts okay so there is only one plane through which the, that is the aboral oral axis through which if i dissect the animal i get multiple parts which are similar to each other and these parts are are arranged around one axis so radially and that is why it is known as radial symmetry radial symmetry is also seen in some cylindrates in some of course the starfish brittle star sea urchin now next way of classifying the animals uh, of the whole animal kingdom is what grade of organization they show that means whether they are unicellular or they are multicellular or they are something more than multicellular okay so first we will see what is unicellular what is multicellular so you will say that the name the, the term only suggest unicellular one cell multicellular more cells right but still what happens is in case of unicellular the cellular grade of organization is there why because there is only one single cell which is doing all the functions the single cell like what are the functions which are required for an organism being it a unicellular or multi multicellular what are the basic functions that are required for the survival respiration nutrition reproduction excretion osmoregulation isn't it defense so there should has to be some sensory mechanism maybe to uh, understand where the food is to understand where the predator is so all these functions have to be there whether the animal is unicellular or it is in unicellular animal all these functions are done by one single cell it is so uh, we can say multi potential or maybe uh, multi talented cell that one cell is doing all the functions on the other hand in multicellular grade there can be some cells which are specialized to perform a particular function you take example of uh, maybe the highest or the most developed uh, animal in the whole animal kingdom which is humans so in humans there are different cells for respiration there is there is the whole respiratory system there are there are lungs then alveoli then there are rbcs which are carrying hemoglobin and then hemoglobin then uh, oxygen is carried from the alveoli to each and every cell through rbc or maybe through hemoglobin yes so respiration is so complex in humans which is so simple in case of amoeba there is just one cell diffusion of oxygen inside used by the uh, cell for making atp uh, energy that is in the form of atp whatever carbon dioxide is produced it will diffuse uh, out through the cytoplasmic membrane now you tell me that which of the two are more efficient a cell which is managing all the functions is more efficient or a system which is developed to perform different functions or a group of system like there is nervous system circulatory system respiratory system specialized cells for specialized function now hemoglobin will not do work of uh, nervous system or the nervous cells are not going to carry oxygen for hemoglobin isn't it so which is more efficient whether a single cell doing all the function is more, more efficient or the specialization of cells or presence of different systems for each function what do you think presence of different, presence of different cells for doing so specialized function okay okay so yes because see you may consider that one cell is uh, uh, maybe it is doing uh, many tasks at a time but it is not that efficient the com efficiency comes with the complexity 
so more, so development of the of a particular cell or uh, for a particular function so that is specialization of that particular cell or we can call it as differentiation that is required for efficiency uh, phylum protozoa which is unicellular grade and phylum porifera which is mainly made up of uh, like comprised of sponges which is multicellular so in this case even if the sponges are multicellular each and every cell of the sponge is involved in doing all the functions okay like uh, uh, there is no division of labor like you like if i if i just try to give you an example suppose you have three subjects you have uh, you, uh, what is your combination cbz so you have chemistry you have botany you have zoology now in chemistry maybe you have six teachers in botany you have six teachers in zoology you have six teachers no so work is divided and each teacher is specialized in maybe as only a small module so they will be focusing on only on that right here here is what here is differentiation specialization on the other hand you have only one class teacher who is teaching you chemistry all six subjects uh, six units botany all six units zoology all six units what is going to be more efficient the division of the work right one person focusing on one particular module so division of labor provides more efficiency which is lacking in case of even sponges so they show multicellular grade but each cell is involved in doing all the function so division of labor is not seen in porifera or the multicellular grade so where you get to see the division of labor it comes with the tissue level organization so when we study the levels of organization one is unicellular level the second is multicellular without division of labor like in case of porifera all cells are doing all the functions and even if there is some kind of specialization there is no interdependency the cells are not dependent on each other they are specialized for doing their particular function they will just do that and forget there is no communication between the cells so that is multicellular level next to that comes little specialized little higher modified that is tissue grade of organization in tissue grade cells are specialized to perform a specific function and they are also interdependent one type of tissue will depend on depend on the other type of tissue for example nervous system depends on the sensory organs then the uh, circulatory system depends on the respiratory system isn't it and of course both depend also on the nervous system so there is interdependency the ner nervous system depends on the uh, maybe endocrine system of the body and again endocrine system is depending on the uh, on the circulatory circulatory system to uh, to carry all the hormones to the target uh, organs isn't it so there is interdependency that comes as there is uh, com as complexity increases and that also uh, gives the efficiency so this interdependency brings uh, or comes into the picture at the tissue grade of organization which is not there in the multicellular grade of organization so when we so now we can classify animal animals in the three types one can be either they can uh, one type is uh, unicellular second type is multicellular third type is multicellular tissue grade okay now this third type of animals which show tissue grade of organization we can further divide it, divide them into two types that is diploblastic and triploblastic now whether they are diploblastic or triploblastic that you would not be able to understand just looking at them uh, from externally but uh, of course the study of the development of that particular animal has given uh, us understanding that such animals would show what external features okay so that we will study when we study each of the phylum but uh, let us first understand what is diploblastic what is triploblastic i am sure these terms are not new to you but just to revise let us revise once again diploblastic have two types of germ layers ectoderm and endoderm ectoderm is the out ectoderm give rise to gives rise to outer uh, uh, layers of the body endoderm gives rise to the gut or it line it, it gives rise to the lining of the gut 
what is present between endoderm and ectoderm is mesoglia now this mesoglia in case of diploblastic body plan it is non cellular there are no cells present ectoderm is made up of cells endoderm is made up of cells mesoglia the layer between ectoderm and endoderm is not made up of cell what is this round structure it is a ts of the body of any animal which is diploblastic so any animal which is diploblastic is cut uh, into uh, through the transverse section and if you look in that section from the top this type of uh, view you will get the outer layer which is developed from ectoderm inner layer which is developed from endoderm between those two there is mesoglia which is non cellular now sometimes in some cases the mesoglia can be cellular but the origin of this cell is not the third origin or different type of origin than ectoderm or endoderm so some ectodermal cells may come in the mesoglia or some endodermal cells can uh, come into mesoglia and mesoglia may appear cellular but it is not the triploblastic plan it is just diploblastic mesoglia can be a cellular or it can be cellular so this is about diploblastic body plan what is the other type in case of tissue grade triploblastic where you have of course external endoderm internal uh, sorry external ectoderm internal endoderm and the middle layer is mesoderm sorry so what is mesoderm basically the cellular layer which is present between the ectoderm and endoderm so here see here the color scheme is given the blue one is ectoderm the pink is mesoderm and the uh, the lining of the gut or the gut is made up of what endoderm so again this triploblastic organization which is a type of tissue grade of organization has three types okay and which are these three types a silomate pseudo silomate and silomate now based on what these three types are because all the three have presence of mesoderm the third or a type of germinal layer but they are divided into three types now why these three types are or uh, these are be, um, these are on the basis of presence or absence or the type of coelom that is present now what is coelom coelom the word coelom means the cavity but which cavity even in the gut there is cavity even in the brain there is cavity in which cerebro spinal fluid is there in the spinal cord there is a cavity in the bones maybe you can say that there is a cavity which is filled with bone marrow so this coelom which says cavity where it is exactly present so this is a cavity which is not filled with anything so uh, in this case the first uh, diagram which which says a okay there is no cavity present there is only gut cavity okay which is not a coelom it is a gut now in second case if you can see there is ectoderm there is mesoderm and there is yellow endoderm inside but between the endoderm and the mesoderm there is some empty space which is not filled with anything this is known as coelom the cavity between the body wall and the gut so our gut is uh, practically hanging in the cavity so your esophagus then your uh, stomach then your intestine everything is hanging in the cavity and this cavity is known as coelom but here it is named as pseudo coelom pseudo is what false so why it is called pseudo coelom because this cavity is not so from one side it has got mesoderm but from the other side it has endoderm so it is not a true cavity the true cavity should be present between the two layers of mesoderm okay between the two layers of the third germinal layer that is mesoderm so therefore this case is pseudo coelom false cavity now see the third case the c diagram okay so here what happens there is ectoderm there is little endoderm which is making the gut and between the ectoderm and endoderm there are two layers of mesoderm which are connected at two specific points and between these two layers of mesoderm there is a empty space 
Okay, so this particular cavity, this particular coelom has mesoderm from both the sides. It is completely lined with mesoderm. Okay, and hence it is known as true coelom. And all the animals which show this type of coelom, which is lined with mesoderm on both the sides, is are known as coelomate organisms. So this is also homework for you. You have to give me one example for a coelomate, one example for pseudo coelomate, and three, five, six examples for coelomate. Because coelomate is more common, it is more you are, you could be more familiar with the examples which are coelomate. So best example that I could give you is humans, mammals are all coelomate. So which uh, animals are pseudo silomate and which are uh, a silomate that you have to tell me. But remember when you search for this, you don't have to come up with the scientific name. You have to come with come up with the common names. Okay, common names that we can relate to common names we can that we can easily remember. Okay, this is about the three types which are of triploblastic organization. That is a silomate, silomate and silomate. So let us quickly revise how we have classified the grades of organization. First, cellular and multicellular. Then in multicellular, there are some which do not show division of labor. And then there are some which show division of labor, which is the, the group that shows division of labor is known as tissue grade. The tissue grade is again divided into two. That is diploblastic, those which develop from two germ layers and triploblastic, those animals which developed from three germ layers. Now in triploblastic, we have again three types, silomate, pseudosilomate and acilomate. Okay, so till that, till here, I hope it is clear to you. Yes, any doubts till here? No, no ma'am. Ma no, ma okay, okay. So let us move no, ahead. No, no ma'am. No, it oh is a, it is an abundant shale by maybe some mollusk and hermit crab is just residing in that uh, particular uh, uh, shell. So why this uh, has come here? Because I want to uh, tell you about this cephalization. So anything that is related to cephalo is something related to the head. Okay, and what is cephalization? It is specialization of the head. So many important organs are concentrated at one part of the body and that is known as that is head and hence it is known as cephalization. It is some characteristic that has appeared in the animal kingdom right from the lower um, phyla. So in case of humans, you see why there is compulsory to wear helmet when you are uh, riding bike. It is, sometimes it is OK to break leg or uh, uh, hand than breaking your head. Why? Because there are all the vital organs which are present on the head. There is brain, of course, then there are eyes, nose, then ears, then your mouth. So all the important organs are concentrated at one part. OK, and that is known as cephalization, specialization of head. And why this particular characteristics that this particular plan has survived in case of evolution? Because it is it is easier to protect one part of the body when there is a danger. And protecting one part is protecting all the important organs. And that is why cephalization is something that has got selected in the course of evolution. So cephalization is seen in animals like you can say here, this is a crab. So in crab also the most important organs, the antennae and chile and the maybe the eyes and then the, of course the brain, the ganglions are all concentrated at one place. In case of lobster, in case of cockroach, you can see. So this is something which is specialization that has occurred and that has selected over the course of uh, evolution. So next uh, one topic that remains uh, is the segmentation okay but segmentation we will uh, discuss in the uh, next lecture because otherwise it will be too much uh, for today so next lecture we will uh, discuss segmentation and then we will also uh, start with the uh, phylum protozoa okay so
what I, uh, what uh, homework that I have given to you is you have to find out examples for symmetry. You have to find out examples of silomate, a silomate and pseudo silomate organisms. OK, yes. Anything that you want to ask here? Any doubts, anything that you want to ask or tell? We have five, six minutes for discussion. <laughs> 